Today's video is a subscriber request and deals with the history of the short-lived group Badlands. Strangely enough, each member of Badlands is either related to Black Sabbath or Ozzy Osbourne in some way. The origin of the group really began with guitarist Jakey e. Lee, who played with Ozzy from 1982 to 1987, and he would replace the late guitarist Randy Rhodes. Lee would play on two of Ozzy's records and left due to personality conflicts with the other band members and of course with Ozzy's manager and wife Sharon Osbourne. Lee would end up accusing her of cheating him out of royalties and songwriting credits. It was prior to joining Badlands, singer Ray Gillen would start his career in the New Jersey band Paradox that played both schools and basement parties in Hackensack. He'd front some other local bands, including Rondinelli, which was founded by Bobby Rondinelli from the group Rainbow. But unable to land a major recording contract, Gillen felt disillusioned and at one point even auditioned for the Broadway show Cats. He soon joined Black Sabbath in 1986 after Glenn Hughes got into a fight with the band's manager, leaving him unable to perform. Gillen left Black Sabbath though a year later in 1987 and hooked up with ex-Whitesnake guitarist John Sykes on a project that ultimately didn't really get off the ground. Gillen though was a huge fan of guitarist Jakey e. Lee's playing in Ozzy's band. He at one point even got his phone number and left him numerous voicemails, but the guitarist never called him back. It wasn't until Gillen got his mom to leave Lee a long message that the guitarist finally called him back. The pair soon met over Chinese food and Gillen would remark to the record newspaper, we discussed ideas over Chinese food and when we both got done, Jake said to me, you're the guy that I've been looking for, and I replied, you're the guy that I've been looking for. What made the band exciting to the musicians was that they weren't hired guns anymore, they were now the ones calling the shots. Drummer Eric Singer, who also played with Black Sabbath in addition to Lita Ford, would also be added to the lineup. The original rehearsals for Badlands were actually done without a bass player. The guitar maker BC Rich was trying to woo Jakey e. Lee over to their company, and one day they sent a limo for Lee to come visit their offices and also in the limo was his friend bassist Greg Chason who actually auditioned for Ozzy's band but never got the gig but he met Lee at the audition and they remained friends for a number of years. They even talked about starting a band together once Lee left Ozzy's group. It was during that limo ride Lee played Chase on some of the rehearsal tapes that they had done so far for this upcoming project he was working on. Chase on would end up auditioning for the group and they had their lineup solidified and they called themselves Badlands. With their strange connection to Ozzy and Black Sabbath, you might expect Badlands to sound similar to both groups, but they didn't. The band's sound was more blues based and hard rock and shared more in common with Led Zeppelin. The band would go into the studio, they did some demos, and nearly signed with Cinderella manager Larry Mazur, but they ended up going with Paul O'Neill. While no one in the group seemed to like O'Neill, he made many grand promises, some of which came true, others which of course didn't. O'Neill ended up getting Badlands the deal with Atlantic Records, and strangely enough, he'd also co-produced the group's 1989 debut album, which was self-titled. The record ended up costing the band about $400,000 to make. Unbeknownst to the members during the mixing process for their debut record, O'Neill changed some of the drum sounds and buried the bass on the record, angering the band. Many of the songs on the first record, the assistance of O'Neill, were also a result of 30 or more takes, whereas their subsequent record was maybe four takes. The first half of the album was recorded in Los Angeles, but Atlantic Records didn't hear any hit songs, so they had the band come to New York City where their offices were and write some more tunes, resulting on the tracks Highwire and Dreams in the Dark, as well as Hard Driver. To support the first record, Badlands would tour with Great White and Tesla. Their debut album would peak at number 57 on the Billboard charts, selling around 480,000 copies, just short of going gold. The album, however, underperformed in the eyes of Atlantic, but it still received good reviews and got some airplay on MTV, and it even made Rolling Stone's list of 50 greatest heavy metal albums. Badlands would return in 1991 with their second album, Voodoo Highway. Their sophomore effort is where things really started to come to a head. Drummer Eric Singer was fired from the group prior to the recording of the album, as Greg Chason would admit to Full and Bloom that he never really got along with the drummer. The drummer would end up joining Paul Stanley's solo band and later went on to join KISS. The band would enlist Racer X drummer Jeff Martin, but the lineup change did very little to alleviate the band's internal problems, and Gillen and Lee started butting heads over Badlands sound. 
Gillen had written about three or four tunes that Lee took a profound disinterest in. Gillen would end up going to Atlantic Records A&R man Jason Flom, telling him that he had written potentially three or four hit songs, but the band wasn't interested in doing any more recording, because as far as they were concerned, the record was done. Lee would tell Kerrang! Magazine that one of Gillen's songs sounded like the White Snake Ballad, Is This Love, while another song sounded like The Cult. As Badlands were wrapping up their second album, Atlantic all of a sudden pulled them out of the studio, saying they once again didn't hear a hit song and asked them to write some more tunes, even asking them to maybe work with some outside songwriters including Desmond Child. But Gillen would quit the band during this period of time and he would reveal to Kerrang that he purposely didn't put any thank yous on the record liner notes because he wasn't proud of the album. The disagreement between the band and their label led to a six week standoff with the band threatening to hit the road if they couldn't finish the album. Atlantic blinked and let the band finish the record, but they did little to really promote the album. Voodoo Highway would sell far fewer copies than its predecessor. It was between the release of the group's first and second albums that Gillen's physical appearance started to deteriorate. The band actually had to cancel a month of touring dates on their first record because the frontman came down with pneumonia. While Gillen didn't share his diagnosis with his bandmates at the time, it would later come out that Gillen had AIDS. Years later, Jakey e. Lee would give an interview to Dean Delray's Let There Be Talk podcast, where he revealed that Gillen never told him about his condition. Lee would add that Gillen once submitted to using heroin with his uncle, who he later found out was diagnosed with AIDS. It was during the tour for their second record, the band fired their manager, Paul O'Neill. Lee would add in the same interview that O'Neill was fired over missing money, and O'Neill was the only one in the band's circle who knew about Gillen's health diagnosis. It was initially kept private from Gillen's bandmates and the record label. But when Lee told O'Neill they wanted to let him go, he revealed Gillen's diagnosis to the guitarist and threatened that if he was fired, he'd let Atlantic know about it as well. He ended up following through on his threat once he was let go. It was sometime after the release of the band's second record, Gillen was fired from the group due to what Lee described to Krang as an, I quote, erratic behavior. Lee in the same interview also criticized Gillen for canceling one show due to a boil he had on his neck, stating, and I quote, how many people show up to the gig to see Ray Gillen's moves? Gillen would answer back in a separate issue of Kerrang saying it was actually a cyst and he had it removed and it was on doctor's orders that he not play the show. Gillen would clarify he did end up doing the gig anyway, but he would answer back about how he's not David Lee Roth saying, true, I ain't no David Lee Roth, but I sing a lot better than he does and Jake couldn't wear Eddie Van Halen's socks. Gillen would go on to call Lee a lazy guitarist. In Lee's Kerrang! interview, he would reveal ahead of a planned UK tour in 1992 that the band had a new vocalist, African-American singer Debbie Holiday, who was the daughter of Jimmy Holiday, who you might know for the Dolly Parton song, Put a Little Love in Your Heart. Ahead of that planned UK tour though, the promoter started to panic due to low ticket sales and begged Gillen to reconcile with the band, which he did, and he would end up doing the shows. Fast forward to Badlands July 2nd, 1992 show at the London Astoria. During the set, Gillen would pull out that issue of Kerrang! Magazine that Lee gave an interview to. He held it up to the crowd and said, there's two sides to every story. To those in attendance, Lee would stand to the side of the stage, mouthing the words, it's all true. Despite the tension, the band soldiered on with the set, winning rave reviews for their performance that night. Some in the crowd would even chant, don't break up. It was following that tour Gillen finally left Badlands and the group would recruit vocalist John West, who they planned to do a third record with, but the music scene was changing and Atlantic, who was disappointed with the performance of the band's first two albums, dropped the group. However, prior to Gillen's departure, he had recorded some demos with the band that were eventually rejected by Atlantic, but they would be posthumously released in 1998 under the name Dusk for Pony Canyon Records. Following Gillen leaving the group, he'd go on to work with several other musicians, including the group's Sun Red Sun, which consisted of former Alice in Chains bassist Mike Starr. But in December of 1993, Gillen would pass away due to complications from AIDS. One of the biggest questions for fans is why Atlantic never reissued the albums or re-released them. There's been various rumors as to why. Eddie Trunk would claim in a 2014 interview with Greg Chason and Jake E. Lee that the reason, according to a and people who he spoke with, was due to Gillen's behavior with groupies after he learned of his health diagnosis. However, the surviving members of Badlands would claim that they'd never heard that story and it had more to do with the politics of the record label. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to like button, subscribe and see you again rock and roll true stories.